Hi everyone, I'm Shiny from Leica Camera Malaysia. A very warm welcome to Red Dot Room once again for another online sharing session. Tonight, we welcome Lucas back again as our moderator. Our guest speaker is Matthias Hing, an international photojournalist who spent much of his time on assignment and conducting photography talks. Matthias will share with us how the M system helped him as a photojournalist. His body of work cover his travel to place of war, disaster, poverty, and human struggle. Let's sit back and enjoy the session with Matthias. His documentary work that capture key moment and turning point in history with Laika M. Over to you, Lucas and Matthias. Thank you, Shani. Thank you. So just a couple of words from my side. I don't have much to say today, so Matthias will take over soon. If you have any questions, um, please drop them into the chat box and then I will ask Matthias accordingly. So throwing all the questions to him. And yeah, as Shani already said, uh, sit back and enjoy the session. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Shani. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. and. Wherever you are in the world, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how I work with the M system. And I'm going to show you about my photos on 9-11, on September 11. So, so how it all started with, um, with my assignment. When um, September 11 happened, I was uh, I was in Australia and um, I was watching the news and and then there was a news outbreak. You know, uh, the Twin Tower got hit by uh, by an by an airplane, the first one. And I was like, "Is this for real?" You know, and and the second plane went in, crashed into the building, and that's when you know immediately the, everybody knew this was a terrorist attack. And of course, and, and um, I've got relations there, and my auntie lives in New York, so immediately I picked up the phone and uh, gave her a call, and uh, she was okay, and and I, and I was uh, ready to go. You know, I was thinking, should I go? Uh, I need to find to get arrangements on uh, flights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And with all this going on, by then it was a really week, so it was too late to get into New York, and I had a few of my friends that went into New York and uh, they told me that it's, it's a bit too late. So I decided to um, go to um, Pakistan and from Pakistan going to Afghanistan. So um, I had three M cameras with me. So at that time, uh, digital wasn't, wasn't that popular yet. So I was just still using a film camera. So all these photos uh, you're about to see were all shot on the M6, uh, shot on purely on film. So I'll start with this. This is the map, and just give you uh, an an idea, you know how vast it is from Pakistan to, uh, getting to Afghanistan. So I went to Islamabad first. I had to get a few documentation done, and I went to Peshawar. So from Peshawar, I crossed, crossed into the border to Afghanistan. So this was in Islamabad. They had a big protest. And um, so that was uh, during the 9-11 uh, crisis. So, so I just happened to be there and um, started taking photos on what the Pakistanis were fighting and uh, protest all about, you know, because in, in the whole world, when September 11, Twin Tower collapsed, uh, people were in distress, you know, and angry, whereas in Pakistan, Afghanistan, people were celebrating. So uh, that was uh, also uh, for me to, to find out and see for myself you know whether it's true or not and i went in there to, to cover the footage on that uh, 
so these are all the uh, protests in Islamabad. And this is the road to Jalalabad into Afghanistan on the border. So traveling out there, um, I think if you, this time if you, you know, going to such places, traveling on digital camera can be quite a challenge because your camera, your battery do run off, uh, run flat uh, because there's, there's no excess of charging your battery. So um, I've done it. On, on various occasions, not on, on Afghanistan, on digital camera. So what I used to do, I used to carry a uh, solar battery pack or, or a uh, car charger. So this is a market. Uh, this market is as well um, getting into uh, Pakistan, from Pakistan to Afghanistan. Uh, this is one of the routes that I had to travel. And just give you a bit of an idea, this is uh, out in the mountainous area. So uh, I had a break and, you know, um, people were, you know, people had, they were, had Kalashikov and all kinds of weapons with them. Um, so this was on my way in. And Playground is not a luxury like what we have in the Western world. So people out there, you know, they, they make do whatever they have. And so there is the bus, the bus is no longer in use and that bus is now used as a, um, as a playground. So during the, um, when, U.S. bomb Kabul. They had a riot, so um, so this was the day when um, U.S. bomb Kabul, and there were about fifty foreign correspondents out there. So so we were out there taking pictures, and um, how I work with my my M system and camera. So this is. Uh, uh, because this is digital, but the one I used was M6 film camera, and I had uh, I carry about three camera bodies. And why I carry three camera bodies is because um, sometimes I don't have time to reload my film, so I'll have uh, two bodies, two camera bodies with same lens, and one in different lens. So just just in need if I if I run out of uh, film, and I've just switched to the other camera. So this is one of the protests, the riot police were coming in. Matthias, maybe one question in between. I've already yeah. received one. So in that picture earlier, we saw your colleagues there photojournalist colleagues and uh, as I can see some of them they have uh, quite big systems with them so the question from from Clarence is uh, why did you choose the M camera when there are actually other focus system cameras in the in the market already in 2001 and and what is for you the advantages that comes with the M system okay um, the good thing about the M system uh, for me is simple uh, less uh, features to play around, you know. Uh, so I only have to concentrate on my f-stop, my shutter speed, and my ISO. So in, in, at that time was film, so I just set at one ISO. And my focusing is faster than autofocus. The reason why I say that, if you look at this here, this focusing the movements are very small movements. So when I focus, I just have to do that. Yeah. And they're small, they're small. They're easy to 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 luck around, you know, to move around. You know, you 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 can I could run easily, uh, even if I get hit. Um, the camera doesn't really get damaged that easily because I got a lens hood and you know, and this is brass. 
So that's the reason why I, I, uh, I took the M system with me. And I know it's, it's durable, it's reliable. Uh, and I know it will not break down on me. That's why I, I use M system. I'm not saying other cameras will break down, but I know this is, is, is very robust. It's like a tank, you know, so, so I can use it uh, in all, all weather conditions. So that's, that's the reason why I use the, the M system. And it's not only that, um, the thing that I personally like the M system is because of the optics. So I go for the optical performance because I want the best result. That's why I use the M system. Okay. Um, this was the day uh, when the US bombed Kabul. Uh, how it happened, I was, I had contacts with Taliban uh, when I was in Pakistan. And uh, the, I had contacts with one of the Taliban minister who um, got into Pakistan and we made arrangements and he has sort of agreed to take me in to Afghanistan before all this happened. And the day before US bombed Kabul, he gave me a call and said, look, um, we're not going to Afghanistan. Our, our, our plan, our trip uh, is canceled because uh, they got news that US is gonna bomb Kabul. So I was a bit disappointed, you know, there because I was um, uh, wanting to go in there and cover the uh, the situation there, the crisis there. And he was right. Uh, the day itself, U.S. bombed Kabul, and then when they, when Kabul was bombed, uh, that's when uh, all the Pakistanis and and the Afghanis in Peshawar, they so they went into the city and they had a big protest. So while they had a protest, um, they invited us, you know, to photograph them. And then when they got really angry, they started throwing rocks at us. So here, they were burning tires. So um, how I take this photo, uh, you gotta be quick. So, you know, uh, the, last, the last question was, you know, why not autofocus? Uh, because then as I mentioned earlier, with this, I just have to do, you know, and and the good thing about it, I can see what's around me in my frame. So within my frame, I get a white white frame, and I can see the allowance of what's coming into my picture. So, and this is um, the the police of frying tear gas. So even the police, they don't have proper um, gear for it, for tear gas, so they use handkerchiefs. And what we, what we did, um, we used towel, we soak, we soak our towel, make it really wet, and then we just tie around it. And then we, we sort of dip in you know, our eyes as well because you get really burned, that burning sensation. This, a lot of the um, protesters, they were arrested, but this one, then they were not arrested. So what they did, they locked themselves up. So when they locked themselves up, the riot police immediately knew that uh, you know, they were not out there to protest. Um, people at that time, the um, they love Osama bin Laden, so you know, and they they support they supported the Taliban and Al Qaeda. So in during the protests, um, so a lot of youngsters, even like kids, you know, then they were really emotional. So again, with the M system, it allows me to go really close because um, one um, doesn't feel or doesn't look I'm intruding because I have a small camera and they just tend to forget me. Guys, I have um, one personal question here. You said that you have been in contact with the, with the Taliban. Yeah. So my question is, let's say if you, if you would look like me, for example, 
like a white guy with, with blonde hair. Do you think that would be even possible for you to get so close to, to those people or uh, would that be possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about, to me, it's not about race, it's not about color, it's about trust. Uh, it's who you know. That I would be like an American or something, or I mean, obviously, I'm a foreigner. So yeah. why should they, should these people allow me to come so close? Uh, again, it's it's about trust. You know, uh, I know sometimes they 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 are against Westerners, but in their eyes, even me as an Asian, uh, they look at me as as a Westerner because I'm a foreigner. So again, uh, so in order for me to, how I got in contact with them, I had a good resource, a uh, good contact person uh, who trusted me, uh, who knew what I did. And he had to talk them in and, and try to, to be in contact. And then when it, one of the ministers sort of agreed to meet up and they were sort of, they were sussing me out, you know, they were, they were saying whether this guy is okay or not. So to me, it's, it's all based on trust, actually. I, I've known a few Western uh, photojournalists that's got in excess as well. So again, it's, it's, uh, um, it's getting excess. Access is the most important uh, to get such photos because you know you can be the best photographer in the world, but if you're gonna access, um, then, then you get no photos. So, so uh, don't let your color, your skin color, whatever sort of uh, stop you from, from, from doing what you want to do. To me, it's all about trust. And if you're genuine, people can see it. Because if you're not genuine, people can see that, you know, you're not genuine. So to me, it's all about trust. And especially when you deal with Pashtuns. Pashtuns, if, they, if they're your best friends, they're best friends for life. If you're your enemy, then you're in danger. So that's 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 how strong that bonding is all. Okay. Uh, so then again, I was saying they were throwing rocks. So again, uh, the thing that what concerned me most when I was there, um, I was not too worried about the bullets. I was more worried about the bricks. Because they're throwing bricks, you know, if this hit my head, then I'll probably, you know, die of a, get brain hemorrhage. So uh, I was more uh, worried about this because, you know, you get all kinds of people of all ages, you know, sometimes you get kids as well. So sometimes, you know, they, they don't even think and they start throwing. Uh, so again, it's, it's how you move in, you know, uh, you got to be confident, uh, self-confident to go in. And, and show that, um, uh, I wouldn't say that, show that you're not afraid, show that, that you are doing a true reporting of, of what you want to show. Okay. So, and this is one of it as well. So, working in, in such environment, such situation, um, it's very hard to take a good photo because you're surrounded with a, with a crowd and then you get pushed around. So, um, and also bearing in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm not just only, only photographer there. So there are quite a number of photographers out there trying to get the best photo. So you do get pushed around. So again, um, working with a small camera to me, that's an advantage uh, with the M system because uh, M system, you know, uh, in such crowded, tight space, uh, I can still lift up my camera and I can still take photos which not which doesn't take too much space. Like for instance, a lot of them like using the 35, uh, 1735 or the 7200, you know, it's, it's too bulky. Yeah, but again, every, every photographer is different, different way of working. So, um, Again, you know, I, I look for expression, uh, whatever catches my eyes. I have no uh, plan of how I want my photos to look like. Uh, I work through the environment of the scene.
So, see, kids were very, very emotional during that protest, yeah. So, um, they had no one to, to, to hit on, so it came to a point, they started throwing rocks at us, and then they invited us in and started throwing rocks at us again. So just give you an idea, you know, and, and you take photos here. For me, um, I don't shoot like a machine gun. I um, I very constructive what I shoot. So and and then what more? This film was even harder because you don't you can't even see what you're taking until you until you go back and start the process. Uh, so so whatever catches my eyes, I take the shot. Again, um, the good thing about the the range finder. You know, like this hand here coming out, yeah, I could straight away see it, like how our naked eye sees. But if you sh if you shot on a on a DSLR camera, uh, it's more likely you seeing you see something coming in your way, and then it's like out of focus, and you might think it's not a good picture. Matthias, there's one question regarding the film. So due to the to the heat in Pakistan and Afghanistan, yeah. how the color performance uh, vary? Um, it was okay, and I used to use a lot of slides, professional uh, slides. I used to use a Povia. Then I started using the uh, pro uh, negative film. So, in temperature wise, was not really an issue. So, what I did, I brought my own chemicals, I, uh, developer, I brought my own scanner, and uh, then the, the day, once I finish the day, I go back to base, you know, wherever I'm staying, I will start uh, processing it. And when I process, then I start to scan. Uh, of course, um, uh, I don't get a, a really clean film because, you know, in, sometimes you process in a dusty room, so you do get uh, dust here and there. So, uh, so a lot of my film, a lot of my 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 uh, Pakistan Afghanistan shots on film, um, a lot of scratches as well. But uh, at that time, you know, with the scanner, you know, uh, I could sort of retouch from the Photoshop to sort of um, to clean the dust. So this um, came to a point where everybody got really met you know and they started burning the u.s flag so again this shot i only took that so they're burning it and you know in that shot and i took about four frames so as you can see there are a lot of movements and then you can see this as the photographer just came right in front of me and pulled out and took the shot you know so sometimes in such a uh, situation, um, you you it's a challenge. Uh, you 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 get pushed around all the time. So this one, while I took this photo, I was actually being pushed, pushed by this this guy. You know, I I, I can't remember who who was it, because you know you just you just don't have time to to argue with them or fight with them. You know, um, so when he pushed me, I took the shot, and that's when I get this motion blur. Mine just came in my way. This was during the protests. So in the midst of the protests, um, you know, they pray five times a day. So, uh, so they they stopped the protest and they they started praying. So even the even the police joined the protesters. As you can see, his his rifle is there. Um, This one, another shot. Same here, you know, I get, you get pushed around all the time. Uh, that's when, you know, um, it's best that, you know, you carry something small, compact. Because you carry something big, you know, uh, to move around in such a crowd, uh, it's, it's, gonna, it's not gonna be easy, even with a, with a compact M camera, uh, it's rather difficult to move. So. Uh, there's one question from Joffrey who's asking if you if you go to that let's say journalism jobs do you subscribe to the NUJ? Yes, 
And UJ, yep, Fishing Journeys Union. Uh, is that a must or is it is it free? So are you, what what is it in terms of insurance and all these things? Okay, the insurance you, you have to insure it on your own, but no insurance company will insure a photojournalist covering conflict. So even if you want to buy insurance, they, they, they will not insure you. So, uh, so you're going at your own risk. So a lot of photojournalists, you know, they do it because it's, it's, they believe in the cause of what they do. Uh, so it's, it's a risk. So it's high risk. So no insurance will insure you. They will insure your camera, but they will not insure you. Not even through an agency or something like that? Uh, not even like I used, I used to fly on the UN chopper as well. You know, I had to sign a uh, declaration form and United Nations will not take any responsibility if uh, anything happens, if the if the airplane or the chopper crash, you know, so um, they, they will not cover you for that. So you go at your own risk. In fact, um, uh, I took a risk as well, you know, I, I, I flew on the Russian aircraft uh, chopper uh, from Tajikistan to Afghanistan, you know, it's a uh, really old, old Russian helicopter, you know, half an hour ride, you know, and uh, we had to pay like thousand dollars, but there's no guarantee. But in order to get where we wanted to go, so, so yeah, no insurance company will not insure unless I don't know, unless someone knows an insurance company will insure a uh, going to a conflict zone. But I say they will insure your camera. Because I've asked before, and they said, yeah, yeah, we will not insure you, but you insure your camera. But to me, it's pointless because I told them, what happens on date? Who's going to claim my, the, uh, uh, okay, with the camera for it, you know? So, so friend, do I have to add another one because it, it fits into the topic. Um, Francisco is asking, uh, hello to Chicago, by the way. Nice to see you again. Um, how, do you, how do you keep safe for yourself in terms uh, of... Besides of using a small discrete camera, so what would be your, your recommendations to be as safe as possible? Okay, to be safe as possible, always look around you. You know, people, you know, uh, we always get caught up and we take photos. We always go like that, you know, we go really close, you know, and then we, we forget what's around us. Because a lot of us, when we, when we, when we do that, we use this as like, like our protection shield, but it doesn't work that way. You know, so you have to look around when you take photos, you have to look around you no matter what. So which means you, you have to multitask uh, in order to keep safe. You know? uh, of course, you know, um, try to stay as healthy as possible, uh, not to fall sick, not to get injured, because once you are hit, uh, it's, 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 it really slows you down. Yeah. So um, there's, there's no, uh, proper way of staying safe or whatever. You just got to be street smart. You got to look around you, especially what's what's around your back. Yeah. So whenever I'm taking photos, I'm always looking around. Yeah. Then of course you, you have to be as compact as possible. <coughs> well, that's you. The more the more compact you are, yeah, the better it is. So which means what I mean is you know, you just carry minimal. Uh, and then so that you're mobile. And the most important thing, you gotta be incomposed. I always tell people that you have to be incomposed within yourself before you can even compose a picture. Because if you're not incomposed within yourself, if anything happens, you get nervous, you get panicked, and then you're not thinking straight. So that's when you'll be taking photos uh, blindly. Yeah, so which means you have to be in control. So if you're not in control, then you will lose it. Yeah, so no matter what happens, no matter what circumstances, you have to be in control, especially covering such issues. So again, yeah, you know, work, I work really close to my subject. I like working close to my subject because uh, I want to show honest reporting. Uh, I've mentioned this before, I don't use a really wide angle lens uh, because if it's too wide, you get distortion. You don't get distortion on, on, on the M system. You get minimal, um, but uh, I use 35 and 50, and that is the closest to the human eye. 
So by using that, you know, um, what I saw in my eyes and what I shot on the 35 is what I see. So working on such um, situation, you cannot control your pictures. And I say you cannot control, you cannot sort of, I want this to be certain angle, one angle, you have to work at all angles. And, and by doing that, by working all angles, take advantage of taking the best possible angle to portray the strongest image. So this boy, you know, you know, for some reason, you know, he was uh, the main attraction. Everybody was carrying him, and he was throwing rocks, and he was um, he was shouting a lot, you know, and um, you know, in support of the Taliban. And these are the Afghani's. They walk from Kabul to Pakistan. And uh, as as a guy, as as a guy, as a male photographer, to take woman in in burqa being covered, uh, it's not easy because you're not being accepted. So I had friends, you know, a woman photographer. Uh, she could walk into a house and take photos because you know they because she was a woman to take a photo of a woman. So how I did this, you know, again. Um, of course, experience matters, but uh, camera helps a lot because it's a small camera. You know, so, you know, and, and the shutter is quiet. And what I do, I use body language. It's how I get my photos. I use body language. Uh, I use eye contact, but I've got, I cannot see their eyes. But the minute they know my presence uh, there and my camera is there, so what I tend to do, I move around. And when I get to the correct position, I take the shot. And how the way I work, I take a photo, I will take in, in a way, uh, not shoot like crazy. I shoot about three to four frames and I'm, and I'm out. So again, you need to know what you're doing. As I was mentioned earlier, you have to be in compose within yourself to compose your photo. This was taken uh, along the street. So they walk uh, for 15 days. So when I took this photo, all the women were, were sitting on, on one corner and the men are sitting on another corner. So they don't mix them up. How do you know about their stories? Do you have a translator with you? Uh, when I went to this place, I had a translator, but I didn't want to bring my translator because I didn't want to put my, my, translate, my translator in danger. Because at times, you know, they, if they see a translator with a foreigner, in the, for them, they might take it as the translator is a traitor. So I always tell my translator, no, okay, you know, uh, I'll go on my own, I'll get a photos, you wait for me, and once we're done, and if I get in contact, then I'll bring you in. Because I don't want to put them in, I don't want to put them, put them in danger. Uh, then sometimes uh, you get the Afghanis coming in, and at times if I'm lucky, I'm, uh, I get someone who can speak English, and will do a bit of translation for me, and then I will build contact, and I'll bring the translator in. Yeah, so again, in, in covering such such issues, is just not thinking about oneself, not thinking about, about, about me as a photographer. I want to get my best shot. You got to think of your people around you because for for us, you know, we we are there as an observer, we are, we are there to report, we get our photos, we leave the country, uh, we're out of it. But those people they live there. So they have to face the consequences. So you have to be sensitive about it. This um, 
children and, and mothers, you know, they were sitting. Uh, they were quite okay with me. You know, they, they were, uh, I got a shot and they were chatting and joking, you know, but I didn't understand because he was, he was speaking in Pashtun. Uh, but it was a friend, friendly gesture that I got, the warm feeling. That's why I took the picture. Yeah, and uh, the lady covered her face, you know, uh, she was shy. So it was not like she was not like she didn't, don't take a photo of me. She was shy, and uh, and as you can see, the boy on the left, he was uh, laughing away. So you know, even in times like that, you know, in crisis like that, you do see uh, happy moments and people uh, laughing and smiling. Although there are a lot of sorrows, you know, they they went through a lot of difficult times, but uh, you still see that the, the happiness in them. So sometimes it's nice even to just to take photos like that, you make them laugh and smile. It sort of cheers them up. So this area where, where I was, I was the only photographer out there. And um, it, was, uh, it was a difficult, difficult for me to take a photo because every, I, all eyes were on, were on me. Yeah, because I was the only foreigner, I was walking and, and everybody was looking. So uh, again, to be sensitive about it, you just got to be careful. So again, um, when you take a photo, go in with confidence. I'm not saying that you're going like a bull, you know, go in, know what you're doing, take a shot, you know, gesture of thank you and walk away and you day, you know, want to talk, it's even better so you can get information. Sometimes it's quite difficult. I've talked to a few, and at times I get people coming in intruding, and uh, you know, going, coming in very forcefully and very angry. So you got to be very, very sensitive. You got to be careful. So in, in, that, in that sense, uh, what Francisco was asking is that you know how to be safe. So if you get such situation, you back off, yeah. and and then you try to to calm things down. was taken in a room where they were seeking refuge and then you know of course they were eating as well so. unfortunately you see many children uh, in such uh, situations such crisis anywhere in the world you know if there's refugee crisis uh, the civilian suffers the most so, yeah. I said one question from Kieran um so when you are in an environment with with many other photojournalists does it get uh, competitive um depends all depends depends who you're working with yeah i mean if you work with really professional photojournalists they tend to respect your space you tend to respect your space but you get someone who's uh you know wanting to just get world press photo and, and doesn't care about anyone and of course, then you get them, you get people pushing you around and you think that they own the world. So you get a mix of photojournalists. Like uh, one good example, you know, uh, when I was in Pakistan, I, I was with James Natchwe. He's the best photographer in the world, war photographer, uh, besides uh, Robert Kappa. We were working side by side, you know, and uh, we respect each other's um, space. You know, and uh, well, we were taking photos and suddenly this photographer just came right in front of us and took our space and it's like, hey, hang on, what are you doing? He didn't care. So again, so that's why I say it all depends on, 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 on the ethics. So, so you know, uh, professional photographers, you know, they really respect your space and you respect your space as well. You, know, you don't steal pictures, but you get those who are really, you know, want to hit fast, you know, big fame. Uh, that's what they do. So again, it's, uh, it's a pluses and minuses. You meet all kinds of people in this world. So these are all the guys. Yeah, as I was mentioned earlier, the woman was sit in 
one corner and a man was sitting in another corner. How I got this photo, um, this is one of the most sellable photos that I sold to magazines, even to private collectors. Um, when I saw this picture, uh, I told myself, you know, I have to get this picture because this picture is, is, um, is so daunting for me. It's, uh, it sort of captures me. And so what I did, you know, I, I walk, I walk close, again, I'll get my photo. Um, I don't have my camera. I always expose my camera. Okay, and many people was put the camera around like that. I don't because by doing this, sometimes you want to go low. You get you get caught by a strap. So what I did, I just sling my my strap this way, so my camera is free at all angles. So as I was walking, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I walk, and the minute I got to my angle. I squat. So meaning I squat, I went down vertical, parallel rather. And I took my shot. So when I took the first shot, then the second shot, I fine tune my angles. So when I fine tune, either I go back or I go forward a bit, or I bring it up or down. And that's how I got this picture. So um, so I only took about again about three to four frames, and I walked away. Yeah, as I, was, as I was taking this photo, uh, again, you got to look, you got to look around you, you got to hear what's, what's happening. As I was taking this photo, you know, my first frame, second frame, third frame, I could hear people shouting already. So whether they're shouting at me, I don't know, but again, I become aware. So if you stay there too long, then you, you become uh, the scene. So, you know, Took a shot, walk away. Then I look around me, yeah. And sometimes in, and of, when I took the shot, I remember clearly, I took this photo. Uh, these guys, they were shouting because, you know, the, the men are not supposed to take photos of women out there. So what I did, right, I waved at them. Yeah, or I greet them. So again, this is how I, I break the barrier. Yeah, so photography is, is not a, just about taking good pictures, you know, this is about oneself. Yeah, as, as a person. Yeah. Um, this was uh, in Peshawar, in one of the, uh, the main street, you know, there a lot of um, people's, a lot of carpet shops here. And then these two ladies were just sitting down there. I just happened to walk past. Again, um, this photo was nothing in particular. It just caught my eye, you know, lady on the left looking at me, smiling, and lady on the right, oh, I can't see her face. And, and I was just walking past, and I think I was going for, to catch a bite, to have dinner. And I was like, oh, that's a nice shot. So I just stopped because she smiled. So again, for me, someone smiles, is a gesture of like saying hello. So I picked up my camera and took a shot. So there was no, no, no objection at all. But that does not mean that I would take photos going crazy because people around you are watching you. This is the camp. Um, they walked from, uh, from Kabul to Pakistan and um, you know, in, into Peshawar. You know, they, they are two places. One, they were in Peshawar, into Peshawar, and one into Quetta. So uh, Peshawar, I was there in Peshawar and um, this is definitely not supported by the United Nations because if it's supported by the United Nations, all the tents here, they will have a UN sign or NGO, non-government organization. So as you can see, this is all, you know, they made themselves, it's got holes here and, you know, they make do what they have. So this place in this, this site, uh, from my recollection, you know, they had about 100,000 displaced people walk into uh, uh, Peshawar. Water is so important out there, you know, I mean, um, that's how they survive. There's not much food, so a lot of them survive on water and then they make chai, tea. This is uh, just a typical, typical uh, family shot, you know, in a tent. So this, um, 
These are the Tajiks. Other Tajiks are Uzbeks. So they're a the minority. So in, in, in Afghanistan, majority are Pashtuns. So they got the Tajikistan, Tajiks, Uzbeks, and uh, there's one more. I, I can't remember. They are all minority groups. Um, so again, um, this is what they have for their meal. Yeah, this is, um, it was hot, solid bread. The bread, I even tasted the bread. You know, the bread was as hot as like a rock. So what do you have to do? They have to soak it, soak it with water to soften it. So that's what they add. So me in, in, in the camps as well, you know, um, there was no food as well. Even if I had money, I, there's no way I could buy anything. So, so a lot of times, you know, many days I go without food. So just to give you an overview of how massive the place is, all the camps, yeah. yeah. This is um, chips. One, one question. Um, does this affect you personally when you are in, in environments where people are so poor that they cannot even afford yeah, food and stuff like that? Yes, I saw a, a, a documentary about Sebastião Salgado and he went to the places, you know, in war places or where people die from, from hunger. And he said he afterwards, when he, when he comes back, he, he almost falls into a depression. Uh, it affects me. Um, I am very fortunate. I don't get into I don't get into depression. I don't know. Maybe I do, but I, I, I as far as I know, I don't. I'm I'm always as happy as happy as Harry. You know, I'm uh, I'm more of a upside than a downside, um, because um, I do get burnt out. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I get really burnt out by the end of the day. I get really exhausted, and seeing all this is just sort of everything sort of just comes in into me and it just sort of, I could feel it, my whole body, you know, I just feel the weight. Um, but I always tell myself, you know, um, hopefully, you know, with all these photos, you know, um, good things will happen. And I say good things will happen. People will help. If you become awareness, uh, hopefully there will not be uh, war and, and, you know, brutality of uh, uh, humankind. So, so I look at, at, at that sense, you know, I know um, it's hard, you know, because you, you, you cannot solve the world crisis, you know, I mean, there's so many things happening in the world, but um, so and what I do, I, um, I do meditation. Um, I uh, listen to lots of music, you know, that helps me to, to um, overcome it. So this, um, again, this is a photo of uh, sisters living in a tent. Barely anything when I was there. So this went into one of the magazines in Australia. And this photo, how I got this picture? Um, this picture was not even meant to be there. I got this. I was actually taking a photo of this uh, mother and child, rather a son, in a tent. So, and this is the front, and that's the back. So again, when I was taking a photo of this, you know, I went like that, and I did, did this, I was focusing, and my eyes, this, my right eye is opened, and I saw the boy, walking past me. So the minute I turned behind, I was like, oh my goodness, this is a shot. This is a photo, you know. Uh, this is a photo will represent the, the, the displaced people, the Afghans, uh, you know. They were going through such a difficult time. So immediately I turned around, I took, again, about five frames. This is the first shot, I got it. Second shot, the boy moved slightly. Third shot, the boy walked away. The fourth shot, the boy turned around. And the fifth shot, you know, I, I just took, you know, he walked walk away. So, um, so he made the photo for me for this. And, uh, and, and this photo was, um, 
was used uh, worldwide in one of the uh, non-government organizations publication. And, and, and they, that, this photo was used in the magazine for the front cover. This one, um, I um, got a, uh, a taxi. And then this, this taxi, this um, window here, this was the widest it could open. I could not wind down anymore. So, you know, it was really hot and um, we went to the camp. So when, when, when it arrived, all the uh, Afghanis ran towards us. So we were surrounded, me and one of the journalists, uh, we were surrounded by um, uh, all, the, all the Afghanis, you know. There's no way you could even open the door. Uh, so what they were doing, they were wanting to know news about the country because there was no news. They had no radio, uh, they had no communication at all. So they wanted to know uh, what's happening to the country. So we were, we were surrounded by it, you know, and, and as you can see, this man, you know, he was, um, he was so close that, you know, he didn't even realize that his saliva, as you can see that you know, on, on, on the window. Uh, so again, I, I was like, didn't know what to do, you know, uh, thinking that, you know, we, we will swarm or most likely going to be hijacked or attacked by them, you know, but uh, it wasn't, you know, they just wanted to know what was wrong and, you know, they, they wanted news. And I saw that photo, you know, it just caught my eye, you know, lift up my camera immediately and uh, I took about a uh, couple of shots. And again, I wouldn't know until I go back and process it. There's one question regarding the submission of your of your pictures. So when you are shooting for a magazine or a newspaper, uh, did you submit the, the the film to them immediately, or do you always go back first? And, no, and I, uh, for this this situation, there was no way uh, I could courier it because um, courier service was uh, was way out um, in a remote area. So uh, I brought my scanner. I brought process a uh, film. Uh, chemicals so I did my own processing and then uh, after processing then I was scanned so at that time you don't even have time to do contact prints so you know most usually you do a contact print and you pick the best out of it so uh, during this time you know I just look through you know through through the sunlight or the fluorescent light and through the net negative and see whatever catches your eyes scan it so in years oh, later the, yeah. the agency then sorry or say if you if you get a like let's say uh, you get a job from a newspaper or a magazine do you have to submit this immediately or uh, do you always try to sell it afterwards no you have to just you have to submit uh, almost um, the night itself or, or the next morning asap asap yeah so, you know, in, in, in those days, um, digital was rather slow. Uh, you remember when I was in, um, in Iraq, you know, I did transmission, uh, even in Afghanistan, you know, we had to use a satellite phone. Mm -hmm. uh, internet was so slow. You know, so even um, the line was not reliable, was not steady. So one picture would take about, you know, four to five minutes transmission. And some, at times, you know, it's like you're almost there, you know, it's almost like 90% going through and then the line drops. So you lose everything, then you got to resend again, again and again. So at times you can spend the whole night just trying to do that. So uh, again, this is a um, family for the, 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 lady, the girl there in front, she wasn't well. Many of them um, suffered from uh, dehydration, diarrhea. This was in a tent. So as you can see in those days, film days, you know, there's no way I could do color correction. So I shot the way it is. So I, uh, whatever I, I, how you get green, because you know, this tent here is sort of a bit 
a bit cool, a bit greenish. And of course, the, the mother's outfit is green and you get a reflection coming in. So you get a bit of green tone. So for me, I, um, that was what I saw. So I left it as it is. I, um, uh, I, will, not, I will not do color adjustments for that. This was in the hospital. Uh, this was in Peshawar. So um, I went to the hospital and the hospital was filled with um, Afghans. All the Afghanis, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, many of them were suffering from de dehydration, diarrhea. So again, this mother, you know, she carried a child, walked for about 15 days. So this is in a crowded clinic or rather an hospital. So everybody helps everybody. And there was shortage of nurses, medical doctors. Same here. So many of them, uh, they spend the, the whole, uh, the whole day and night with their children. So they sleep there, they sleep on the floor. This girl was just recovering. She had, um, I was told, she had fever, she had diarrhea. Dengue fever is one of the uh, problems out there as well. So, um, you know, you do get cases of people suffering from dengue fever, where certain part of countries is uh, malaria. And this is um, father and child in, in the Mikdu tent. So that's how they live. You know, they lived there for you know, when I was there, you know, they, they, they were already there for about, you know, a couple of months already. So, you know, hoping to get help from the United Nations. So, that's all for, for, for tonight, for my talk. Amazing. Thank you very much, Matthias. I've seen some some talks from you already. We had one together, and I have to I have to say this was by my favorite so far. Yeah. So very very honest stories behind it, and uh, thanks a lot. We have some questions not answered yet. Let, uh -huh. me, let me check on that. Um, another question from from Jovrey uh, is asking like. If you would compare your Leica M to, to uh, Nikon and Canon, do you say you have any, any issues compared to, to those or compared to photo journalists that are using these kind of cameras? Um, I suppose everybody's got a personal choice. Um, I like using a Leica is because uh, it's compact and number one, to I go for the optical performance and what I want is I want optimum result and, and the, the, the reliability and how durable the camera is. You know, I've dropped the camera, uh, it still works, you know, fully manual, you know, it doesn't break down on me. So I know I can rely on the camera even on most difficult conditions. So again, you know, um, comparing to Nikon, Canon, I mean, they are good cameras, but uh, nothing beats, for me, yeah, beats Leica optics. I can shoot, I don't even have to, I don't even bring a flash with me. You know, as I knew, you know, I, I met photographers out there, they, they had, you know, they had, you know, long lenses, flash, you know, because I shoot under low light condition, um, it was not possible for them to capture without uh, without a flash. As for me, I was able to do it. 
Uh, so I was using fast lens. Uh, so I had no issue in that, you know, and I was more flexible, uh, more, 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 more versatile. I can move around very easily. Um, you know, and at times I even go to places where by in a tight spot, you know, uh, carrying a camera is, is, is quite, is quite sensitive. When I say sensitive, um, you don't want to be seen as like, you know, because once sometimes you've been spotted carrying a camera, people sort of eye on you, you know, and you're being followed, uh, not followed, that they, they, they're going to rob you, it's more of like they get, um, they're just curious, you see, and, and I don't want that, that, that attention and create attraction. So, you know, with this camera, you know, it's, it's easy. And um, I know what, what, the, what the optics can do and what the performance of this camera is I'm able to capture even under most uh, really poor lighting condition. Another question from Stefan Lim. And he's asking for those kind of trips, how do you how do you prepare your equipment? So how do you know how many films you have to bring, um, and uh, do you how do you select the ISO sensitivity? Do you do you switch when you go from day to night shots? And also you mentioned that you bring your own chemicals, so you must have a, a basement somewhere to to do all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the early days when shooting film. Um, of course, I carry about, in those days, I carry about two, two to three cameras, uh, two 35 millimeter lens, uh, 124 as a backup, 150. So, uh, so one camera body will be either 24 or 50, the, the two of it will be a 35. Mm -hmm. and, and I carry chemicals, I'll carry a, a C41 chemical. And if I do find a, a lab there, then I will, I will keep my chemical and I will just process from the local lab, yeah, that's one. Two, uh, how many rolls I estimate? Like for instance, if I'm going to say Afghanistan, I'm gonna spend there for a month, um, I carry 200 rolls of film. And when I carry 200 rolls of film, um, I more or less know how I shoot, you know, I don't shoot like, you know, one, one subject, I will shoot 36 frames, you know, I will shoot, you know, uh, 36 frames, I could, I would cover, you know, a good number of, of images. So again, it's knowing how your style of shooting mm. and uh, processing. I use a scanner. Uh, I take a scanner with me, a film scanner. So that's what I did. And how, what ISO to use? I used to carry on different various of different of ISO speed, like 400, 1600, uh, and I can push it 3200 or 6400. But then I realized that uh, I found a better way for me to just standardize. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's how knowing how you work. So what I did, I just use 400 as my standard base. So if I need to push, then I will push for my processing. So instead of using a 1600 ISO, I still use the 400 ISO, I read it at 1600 and I push process and that's what I did. So in that sense, I, there's no confusion. And of course I had, I had carried, I carried markers uh, to mark on my, my cassette, my film cassette, what ISO speed I use, uh, I dated, uh, I carried a notebook. When I, and when I say notebook, you know, I don't mean in today's technology notebook, just paper notebook, you know, reporter's diary. So I carry that and record right names, the right details, facts. So, um, and those are, those were the things that, that uh, is a must for all photojournalists, all journalists. Another question from Samuel. Um, he's asking the pictures that we saw today, was that uh, before or after uh, the passing of Bin Laden? Before. It was before, yeah. Yeah, before Bin Laden was saying hiding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, um, I was meant to take photo of, photos of uh, the Taliban leader Mullah Omar, um, but um, because of the bombing of uh, Kabul, and never had a chance to take photos of uh, Mullah Omar. Um, it was difficult because he never allowed any 
uh, photographer to take photos of him. Mm -hmm. So, but because I had access in one of the ministers and he was, he told me no guarantee. Uh, I took the risk because um, I could be kidnapped, you know, and uh, uh, I could use, uh, you know, they, they, they could kill me for that. Yeah. But uh, I trusted him. So, because um, it's just the vibes, I just felt it, you know, and he was honest, you know, and uh, when he knew that the U.S. was going to bomb Kabul. He called the trip off. So he could have sort of took me along as well, you know, but uh, he didn't. And one question from uh, Francisco again. Do you keep your emotions always under control? I do. When I'm taking photos here, yeah, I uh, sometimes I get uh, affected. Then I pull myself back and it's like, no, no, you know, uh, I should not get affected because I do then and um, I become biased, I become lopsided, you know. So um, sometimes you see that things are not supposed to happen, you get frustrated. Then I keep reminding myself, you know, the only thing is to record it uh, through honest reporting, whether it's good or it's bad. You report as it is, yeah, and 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 not to over sensationalize it. So you know, so to me, I think that's very important. And of course, by end of the day, you know, I, I get pretty frustrated. Uh, there are a lot of cases whereby things are not meant supposed to happen, and it happened. So uh, I get very very frustrated, very angry. You know, I mean, um, there was a case whereby. I didn't see it for myself. I was in Pakistan, in, uh, in, in Jalalabad, in the Khyber Pass. And so I don't know whether it's true or not, but because um, I wasn't there and news came back from other reports, um, locals were transporting uh, food um, or rather supplies uh, and they were bombed. Yeah. So again, I got no proof. So again, when I, when we heard we we wanted to get proof, you know, wanted to get uh, an answer for it. No one wants to to voice it out, you know. Um, so again, in in such crisis, sometimes you you got to be there and see for yourself. Then 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 you know whether it's true or not. But if you hear such things, uh, you just you just have to take it as it is until you see for your own for your own eyes. So, yeah, but so it was frustrating. It was frustrating. Yeah, when, I, when we heard about that, that you know, um, you and Trump got, got bombed. Yeah. Okay, so as I can see, no questions. Oh, oh there's another one. Sorry. I forgot almost about that. Uh, let me check on that. So, um, are you still using film or, or more digital today? Um, I'm using more digital today. You know, I still use film. Uh, I still like I still like film. I like the film feel. You know, um, but um, digital is, is is getting better and better. So um, so yeah. So I, I'm using more more digital now because digital, you know, you can transmit almost immediately, uh, right on the spot if if you got access to the internet wherever you are, and of course you can do transmission. And digital so, is becoming more like film in terms of the latitude level. So, so you still have the uh, M6 lineup that you brought to Afghanistan, the three? Yes, yes, yep. I still, I still have it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, then, yeah, we are done with the questions. Uh, again, thank you very much, Matthias. And, um, I will pass back to Shiny then. I think she has a small announcement at the end of our session. And um, yeah, Matthias, thank you very much for, for talking to us today. Um, always very interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm really not lying about that. I, as I said, I have seen you now a couple of times and uh, I think I will do listen to you for another couple of times. So <laughs> don't get boring. 
Thanks, Thank Lucas. You very much.